public hearings are being held pursuant to section 465 of the Local Government Act. All members of the public will be given a reasonable time to be heard or to present written submissions respecting matters contained in the bylaws that are the subject of these hearings. All information, correspondence, petitions or reports that have been received by noon today concerning the subject bylaws have been circulated to Council and are available to the public as part of the meeting package. For each hearing, staff will provide their report, followed by an opportunity for the applicant to speak. Members of the public who have pre-registered to speak have been added to the speakers list in the order that requests were received. Those pre-registered will be provided the opportunity for public comment according to the order on the speakers list, followed by comment from those who have not pre-registered. Anyone who is not pre-registered can still attend council chambers and wait to speak following those on the speakers list or alternatively can electronically participate by calling the conference line during the live hearing at 778-907-2071 and entering meeting ID 506-489-9374 and passcode 485-186. Speakers will be asked to state their name and civic address. Please note that all representations, whether written, verbal, or electronic, are available to the public for viewing as part of the public record. Remarks will be limited to five minutes per speaker and should include all of the relevant information in, their, in the presentation. Further opportunity will be afforded to all members of the public to speak a second or third time with new information only once all persons have had an opportunity to speak. Council may ask questions of staff, the applicant and the public, but once the public hearings are over, no new information can be received. Council debate on the bylaws will take place during the regular council meeting following the conclusion of the public hearings. At that time, any questions of staff will be for clarification purposes only. The corporate officer will now provide information on the notice of these public hearings. Uh, thank you, Mayor Boop. So notice that the public hearings occurred in the Summerland Review issues of June 2nd and June 9th, 2022, and was posted at the Municipal Hall and on the district's website. In addition, for public hearing number one, five notices were mailed to owners and occupiers on May 28th, 2022, and for public hearing number two, 14 notices were mailed to owners and occupiers on May 27th, 2022. Thank you. I'll go to uh, Alex to present the staff report, please. Yeah, good evening, Council. So the purpose of zoning amendment bylaw number 2022-004 is to change the zoning designation of the subject property at 10314 Blair Street from institutional to agricultural small acreage. The property is approximately 1,092 square meters and, is currently, and currently contains a single detached dwelling and a detached garage. The property is located on the corner of Blair Street and Victoria Road North and is currently accessed by a single driveway off Blair. The subject property is designated as agricultural in the official community plan. The current zoning of the property is institutional and this reflects the use of the abutting property as a church. The property is located within and surrounding, surrounded by the agricultural land reserve. The agricultural designation in the OCP reflects the ALR designation and the potential of this land for future farm use. It also does not signal this property for future expansion of residential development. The applicant has requested to change the zoning in order to facilitate the construction of a new single detached dwelling with a secondary suite. The A1 zone allows for a single detached dwelling and a secondary suite. 
It also allows for agricultural uses and other accessory uses typical or typical of our residential zones like home occupations. In comparing the proposed A1 zone to the existing institutional zone, the allowable lot coverage decreases. Oh, I clicked the wrong button. There we go. <laughs> it, it is also noted that the lot size is not changing and it will be non-conforming under the A1 zone. The setback requirements are fairly similar between the two zones with a slight reduction to the interior side setback and a slight increase to the exterior side setback for buildings with garage doors facing the street. The allowance of building height will also be reduced from four stories to two stories. The current institutional zone is not consistent with the official community plan. The proposed zoning would align with the OCP and reflect the farming potential if lot consolidation happened in the future. It also reflects the boundary of the agricultural land reserve. In summary, the purpose of this amendment is to change the zoning des designation from institutional to agricultural small acreage. This rezoning proposal aligns with the OCP designation, removes the potential for more intensive institutional uses, and allows for the desired use of the property for a single detached dwelling with a secondary suite, among other uses allowed under the A1 zone. Thank you. Thank you. Kendra, did we receive any additional correspondence on this? We did not. Okay, thank you. Um, if the applicant would like to speak, I understand you're here. Uh, Greg Warnstaff, this is your opportunity to get us started with this public hearing number one. Okay. Is there anybody else that would like to come to the podium and speak to the uh, matter of this public hearing? I'll ask a second time. And a third time, is there anyone that would like to speak? Okay, and just confirming there's nobody on the line. Okay. Um, so that is, uh, I will adjourn public hearing number one. And we will go on to public hearing number two, Zoning Bylaw Amendment 9606 and 9806 Victoria Road. My apologies, Council. Did you have any questions of staff? All right, please proceed. So an application has been received for a site-specific text amendment at 9606 and 9806 Victoria Road South. The site-specific zoning designation seeks to amend the heavy industrial zone to include a concrete and asphalt plant as a permitted principal use. The amendment would allow the applicants to bring an existing concrete plant at 9606 Victoria Road South into compliance with the district's zoning bylaw and further expand the concrete plant operation with the addition of, an, of the adjacent property at 9806 Victoria Road South. The subject site is designated as heavy industrial in the district's official community plan and it's currently zoned M2 heavy industrial. The application seeks a site-specific text amendment to this designation to include the concre concrete and asphalt plant as a permitted principal use. The proposed expansion includes a, sta a new sta stationary concrete plant at 9806 Victoria Road South and the decommissioning of the old concrete plant located at 9606 Victoria Road South. The offices and the shop would remain at 9606 Victoria Road South. It should be noted that the pr proposed height of the new concrete silos is taller than the permitted height within the M2 zone. A development variance permit application 
to permit the siting of two silos is being processed in conjunction with this application. The approval of this variance will be required before the issuance of any building permit. Under the district's uh, this, under the District of Summerland's zoning bylaw, concrete and asphalt plant is only a permitted use under the M4 Resource Industrial Zone. This zoning designation was created primarily to accommodate large-scale resource-based industrial operations such as natural resource extraction sites, solid waste and composting facilities, or aggregate material storage yards. There currently exists only one area in the district uh, with the designation of M4. North Prairie Valley has a number of gravel extraction operations and is the site of the municipal solid waste and compost facility. The concrete and asphalt plant use doesn't align perfectly with neighboring heavy industrial properties. Most adjacent uses are of general industrial nature and permitted within the M2 zone, including an equipment rental business, a bottle depot, and a commercial storage facility. Another existing non-conforming concrete facility exists across from the subject property. The concrete and asphalt plant use typically produces nuisances on adjacent properties, such as dust and noise. As a result, these uses have more significant buffering and setback requirements compared to the to the existing to what is existing at the subject properties. Given the decades of previous operation of this use at the site without any reported issues, it can be assumed that the use is compatible with the surrounding area. A modern concrete plant would be more effective in reducing noise and dust pollution due to the improved dust collection systems and quieter plant equipment. An up-to-date concrete plant can produce concrete significantly faster, reducing the amount of idle time for trucks, loading, therefore reducing vehicle emissions and pollutions created by each load of concrete produced. As the expansion being proposed is modest and will have a positive impact on the current nuisances, staff feel that the site-specific use um, is a reasonable solution. Policy 7.6.4.5 of the OCP supports this approach through encouraging the infilling and efficient use of existing industrial lands prior to entertaining new requests for industrial zone property. The proposed expansion uh, of the operation also aligns with the OCP objective to develop a strong, diversified and sustainable economy that will provide for expanded opportunities of employment in the community. The applicant is proposing to bring an existing local industrial operation into conformance with the district zoning bylaw and also proposes to expand their industrial operation to allow uh, to bring additional employment opportunities to the district. Thank you very much. Thank you, Alex. Kendra, any additional correspondence? All right. Uh, would the applicant care to speak? No. Nope. All right. Um, anybody else would like to speak to this public hearing number two? I'll ask a second time. And a third time. All right. Council, do you have any questions of staff? Nope. I'll declare this public number, hearing number two, adjourned. All right, so we'll go right on to our regular council meeting for the evening session, Monday, June the 13th. This meeting is being, re being recorded live and is streaming. All representations to council, written or verbal, will form part of the public record and be available to the public for viewing electronically or as a written record. Members of the public may access the meeting or participate in the following ways. You can attend council chambers in person, if you wish to do that, please register in advance of the meeting by contacting the corporate officer at corporateofficer at summerland.ca to ensure there is enough space in council chambers. Watch the meeting live or recorded at the District of Summerland YouTube channel, youtube.com, District of Summerland. You can register in advance to speak during the meeting. 
Members of the public who wish to provide comment during the public comment opportunities found under items 8 and 15 are asked to register in advance by calling, sorry, by contacting the cor corporate officer at corporateofficer at summerland.ca with your name, civic address, and how you will be participating in the meeting, whether in person, by telephone, or through Zoom. When you register, the corporate officer will provide you with further details. The fourth way to participate is to request to speak during the meeting. Those who have not registered in advance but wish to speak during the public comment opportunities may be given the opportunity time permitting. After I have provided everyone who has pre-registered with an opportunity to comment, the floor will be open to those in council chambers and those on the conference line. Conference line can be accessed by dialing 778-907-2071 and entering meeting ID 506-489-9374 and passcode 485186. Corporate officer, are there any late items to introduce? No, okay. Could I ask for council to adopt the agenda as presented, please? Councillor Carlson and Councillor Holmes, all in favor? Thank you. And adoption of the council meeting minutes for the evening council meeting of May the 24th. Councillor Van Elfen, Councillor Trainer, all in favor? Great. Uh, moving right into the bylaws that were part of the public hearings tonight. First, 5.1 Zoning Bylaw Amendment for 10314 Blair Street, bylaw number 2022 004. Just have to get this updated here in the right meeting. All right, so we've had first and second reading in our public hearing. Uh, unless there are questions of staff for clarification, I'm going to ask someone to bring forward the motion to read for a third time, Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. That zoning bylaw amendment 10314 Blair Street bylaw number 2022 004 be read a third time. Thank you. Seconded by Councillor Carlson. Any further discussion? All in favor? Councillor Van Elfen, you're in favor as well. Perfect, thank you very much. Thought you probably were, but I wanted to check. That's no problem. 5.2, so this is the second public hearing. Zoning bylaw amendment 9606 and 9806 Victoria Road South, bylaw number 2022-017. Same process. Are there any questions for clarification? Councillor Van Elfen? Okay. You are going to bring forward the motion? I would be glad to, Madam Mayor. That Thank zoning you. bylaw amendment 9606 plus 9806 Victoria Road South bylaw number 2022 017 be read a third time and adopted. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Carlson, you are seconding. All in favor. Councillor Holmes, you're good? Great. Okay, thank you. Uh, on to the mayor's report. I recently heard the Okanagan weather during the month of June described as the June soons. Given the weather we've been having, I feel that this is an accurate description. A marked contrast to the 20 sorry, to June 2021 with its dry weather and record temperatures. People living on Tulamine River Road have been evacuated due to risk of the Tulamine River overflowing its banks, as well as other folks throughout the province. The River Forecast Centre has said the increased risk of flooding depends on where it rains, how much it rains, and how quickly temperatures rise. The spring thaw is about a month late because of cooler than normal spring temperatures. The cooler, wetter spring does have an upside though, and that is a delay in the wildfire season. On May the 25th, the CAO and I attended a call with provincial 
Minister of Municipal Affairs and Immigration, Nathan Cullen, and the Minister of Forests, Katrine Conroy, and staff with the BC Wildfire Service. The call provided an update on the proactive work being done to address the anticipated 2022 wildfire fire seasons. And there were um, some good questions brought forward by uh, elected officials that were in um, uh, areas that were very hard fit, hit by the wildfires last year. The district encourages everyone to sign up for Voyant Alert to receive notifications on critical events such as wildfire and flooding, as well as day-to-day -day communications such as garbage and recycling information, water or sewer notices, and public engagement opportunities. The platform is easy to use, free, and completely anonymous. You can choose which communications you want to receive and you can opt in or out at any time. The afternoon of May 27th, councillors Carlson, Van Elf and Holmes and I, along with two district staffers, joined Anona Campy of the Penticton Indian Band on a land walk of some PIB lands. Just a sec, I'm gonna fall off my chair. That would be embarrassing. This was the third session council has had with Ms. Campy and the first out on their land. We learned about silk, about silk uses of various plants, the history of the area and traditional use of the land and water. After the walk, Anona gave some examples on how the Indian Act and the residential school system has impacted PIB members. On behalf of council and district staff, I thank you again, Anona, for this very interesting and enlightening afternoon. And Councillor Van Elfen, what did we see, the first one you've seen since you moved here 40 years ago? Our pet rattlesnake. Yes, not one, but two. I, along with many elected colleagues throughout the province, had a meeting with UBCM on May the 31st to provide gu guidance on the work being done by that group on the Code of Conduct. Earlier this year, at the request of UBCM, the province legislated that all local governments must consider this document, which lays out conduct by elected officials. Council adopted a Code of Conduct at our May 24th meeting. It will be reviewed at the beginning of next term and annually by council. Due to some personal matters, I decided not to attend the Federation of Canadian Municipalities Convention, FCM, in person, but instead attended the live portions on May the 3rd and 4th. Since then, I have been viewing the in-person sessions that were recorded and uploaded to the event platform. Yeah. Not surprisingly, top of mind for our colleagues across the country are attainable housing, health care and climate change adaptation, and federal funding to support these critical topics. Much of last week, in my role as a board governor with the Real Estate Foundation of BC, I was in New West to attend meetings and the land awards. There are many outstanding projects going on throughout the province. The Land Awards honors and celebrates the best of the best, including all finalists in five categories, as well as two awards given to outstanding individuals. This year, the Emerging Leader Award went to Taylor Whale for her work with educating young Indigenous peoples in Northern BC. And Wayne McCrory was named Land Champion for his decades of work, including establishing a grizzly bear protected area, also in the North. Finally, earlier today at the Committee of the Whole, Council received a presentation on the Downtown Neighbourhood Action Plan, a draft document representing almost 18 months of work by the Downtown Neighbourhood Plan Task Force. Please provide your comments and feedback on the draft action plan. It will be posted later this week to the website and on the district social media channels. We want to hear your thoughts. Please provide your comments and feedback over the next four weeks. And that's my report. Your turn, CAO. Thank you, Your Worship. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Brad Dolovitz, who covered for me for a few days so I could go be with my daughter for the, fir for the birth of our first grandchild. Isla Rose Ellen Bassendowski, born June 3rd and weighing in at seven pounds and one full ounce. Like most people, I've come to loathe Zoom and FaceTime during the pandemic, but now I'm back in Summerland 
am more grateful than ever for those platforms, which allow me to see that precious little thing each day. On June 1st, I had the opportunity to participate in the Business Walk hosted by Chamber of Commerce. It was great to see and hear various ideas, opportunities and concerns of business owners and managers as we walked around the community speaking to businesses. We have a vibrant business sector that provides fantastic services and products for the people right here in Summerland, allowing people to be local and shop local. A shout out to those businesses who support our community every day. After a cold winter and cool spring, bears and other wildlife are making their way through our community looking for an easy meal. Anticipating this, weeks ago, our bylaw staff were proactive and did several night shifts to provide more than 600 warning letters and education to citizens about leaving their garbage cans out overnight. We also put up information on the digital sign, Facebook, the newsletter, bear and area signs in some of our most active areas and have worked with the media to get the message out. We have seen improvement in compliance, but we are planning to conduct interagency enforcement action with the provincial conservation officers who will be providing a $345 fine as a ticketable offense where necessary. We thank the public for working with us to ensure that they avoid leaving out attractants like garbage that habituates bears and other wildlife to people. The weather has brought welcome rain to the area, but unfortunately it's also slowed down some of our line painting program, which continues to get caught up when it can in dry periods between roaming showers that we have been seeing. Paving also continues with some of our larger paving projects moving forward now according to schedule. I'd like to recognize the work of staff in supporting community vibrancy in our parks these last few weeks, from car shows to picnics to action fest to popularity of our new playground. I think we see a great level of service from our park staff and I know that we all appreciate that. Finally, I wanted to let Council know that the large permanent signs for the Trappers area have arrived and the Public Works and Infrastructure staff will be mounting them and installing them in several locations up there. This should help make the public aware of some of the sensitivities of the area and rules for responsible use. We are also looking to do some patrols in the coming weeks for public education and awareness with the guardians from the Penticton Indian Band who often patrol their reserve lands which are right next to our own. With that, I conclude. Thank you. Okay, any questions? All right. Uh, this is our first of two public comment opportunities. Would anybody that is here like to comment on anything that's on the agenda? No, nope. all right. And is there anyone on the line, Kendra? No. Nope. Okay. Uh, on to development reports. 9.1 Development Variance Permit 10609 Rutherford Avenue, DVP 22 004. So the district has received an application for variance at 10609 Rutherford Avenue. The proposal seeks to vary the minimum required interior side setback. The subject property is a small residential lot, 0.5 acres in Prairie Valley. The applicant is proposing to construct a one-story detached garage on the property. The proposed garage will require a variance to the prescribed interior side setback for the A1 zone. In the OCP, the future land use designation of the subject property is agricultural and it is zoned A1 agricultural small acreage. These land uses are consistent with neighboring parcels. The applicant is requesting a variance to section 8.1.6A3 of the zoning bylaw to reduce the interior side setback from four meters to 1.08 meters. This reduction would allow the property owners to construct a large garage and improve their ability to contain vehicles in a tidy manner on the site. It should be noted that a smaller garage could be constructed to meet the zoning bylaw interior side setback requirement. However, the request is for a larger garage. The, the, the request for a larger garage is being made to accommodate up to three vehicles. The subject property presents several physical constraints when determining where to site a garage. The applicants intend to maintain the natural look of the property and preserve the mature trees on the southern portion of the parcel. There is an overflow creek on the south side of the property 
and the house is sited the, the house is sited in the middle of the property and the septic tank and field is located uh, on the north side of the property behind the home given these physical constraints the only reasonable location to site a new garage is in front and to the north of the existing home it should be noted that the existing driveway on the property leads directly to the proposed location of the garage and this site is currently used for vehicle parking So the subject property is designated as A1, despite the parcel not being, despite the parcel size being small, and if and if of similar size uh, to and of sorry, <clears throat> excuse me, and it, uh, and, sorry, I'm just going to start this whole sentence over again. <laughs> the subject property is designated as, as A1 agricultural small small acreage, despite the parcel size being small. And, in a, and if of other of, of similar size to a country residential lot, I just messed the writing up on that one. <laughs> no agricultural activities take place on the property. The A1 zone requires significantly greater setback requirements between structure, structures and property lines compared to the rural or urban residential zones. The intent of these larger setbacks within agricultural zones is to provide physical separation and to reduce the potential conflict between adjacent agricultural uses. There are currently no agricultural uses occurring on the adjacent property to the north. There, are also, there also exists an established cedar hedge spanning along the property line that would screen a garage from the adjacent property. From staff's perspective, the siting of the garage is in the most reasonable location and the proposed building will be consistent in form and scale with other buildings in the area. The requested variance is significant, however, based on the residential nature of the two adjacent properties, it is not anticipated that the approval of this variance will contribute to any conflict between the two properties. As such, staff are recommending or supportive of the proposed variance. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Councillor Holmes. Thank you. So the correspondence uh, we received from the, from the neighbor um, seems their their concern is mainly the the cedar the hedge the, the um, potential damage to it with the construction. So um, now that might if if, if for whatever reason um, those hedges uh, are damaged because of the um, the, the garage. Um, that might be, we might consider that, okay, lots of dispute between neighbors, but um, it would be, uh, it would be a result of, 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 of us allowing it, um, you know, by issuing the DVP. So I think we would have some responsibility. So my question is, uh, how, how do we, how do we assure the neighbors to the north that, um, that, that those their concerns can be alleviated and what would happen if if those cedar hedges were damaged um so i mean ultimately i, I don't think there really is a way to to inch to guarantee that that the hedges wouldn't be damaged um from from my perspective I'll, maybe i'll let brad continue on yeah thanks alex um yeah, I think that's a good question. Uh, it is uh, obviously their primary concern from their letters. I, I do believe that the applicant has done a lot of work on their behalf to try to appease the neighbor's concerns with the hiring of an arborist to investigate the uh, potential damage to the cedar hedges um, from this proposed development and, and, and meeting with those owners. Uh, uh, with the arborist to go over those concerns and how they could alleviate them during the construction process. But like Alex is right, there's, there's risk with any work. Um, uh, regardless of the, the variance process, I don't think the district would be liable, to be honest. Like this is um, uh, a property owner, a property owner issue. Um, hopefully the one property owner um, could alleviate those concerns, but there is always risk. And sometimes that occurs when you have trees or roots that are intergrowing between property lines. And uh, we have, a, I've, I've had a long history of dealing with these type of issues between neighbors before. And in each case, it's a civil dispute in my experience that, that I advise them that they have to work on an arrangement neighbor to neighbor in a friendly fashion.
Councillor Patton. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, and could you please clarify, in the correspondence, it talks about an existing garage that has been turned into a carriage house. But yet in the reports that you're showing us, you have not indicated anything on what use that building is and if it is a legal uh, carriage house or if it's not a legal carriage house. So could you please clarify for me, please? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, so there is there is never any discussion of that structure being a carriage house. Um, from the beginning when I received the application, it was always marked out as a storage building. Um, so it's not, it's not a garage, it's not a carriage house, it's a storage structure. Okay, any other questions? All right, could I have someone bring forward um, a, a motion on this, please? Councillor Barkwell, thank you. Please use your mic. <clears throat> the Council authorized issuance of development variance permit DVP 22-004 for property located at 10609 Rutherford Avenue, legally described as Lot A, District Lot 476, the Suez Division, Yale District Plan 29356, and that a variance to the following sections of zoning bylaw 2000-450 be granted. Side interior setback section 8.1.6, sub A, sub sub three, to vary the interior side yard set back from four meters to one point to the one point zero eight meters proposed. Thank you. Seconder. Councillor Van Elfen. Further discussion. Councillor Van Elfen. Just a comment, Madam Mayor, in the overview shot in the presentation slides of the property it shows an overflow creek i believe the name of that creek is prairie creek so it's just not some overflow body of water it's actually a creek uh, fish bearing thank you any further discussion Okay, I'll call the question. All in favor? Opposed? Councillor Patton is opposed. Okay, on to 9.2. Development variance permit for 9806 5th, uh, Victoria Road South. So this was um, part of our public hearing tonight. DVP 22-006. All right. So the district has received an application for variance. Uh, oh, and that's the wrong. <laughs> doing too many applications today. We've received an application for variance um, at uh, 9806 Victoria Road uh, South for um, a height variance. Um, so the applicants are requesting to increase the allowable height in order to um, allow for the placement of two silos on the subject property. So the subject property is located along Victoria Road South in an established industrial area. In, in addition to the requested uh, to the requested variances, sorry, I'm getting myself so confused tonight here. In addition to the requested variance that it, that is the subject of this application, the property owner is also currently seeking a site-specific rezoning application rezoning of the subject property and the neighboring property to the south. The site-specific zoning designation seeks to amend the heavy industrial M2 zone to include concrete and asphalt plan as a permitted principal use. The zoning amendment will bring an existing concrete plan and business located at 9606 Victoria Road South into compliance with the district's zoning bylaw and allow for the further expansion of the concrete plan operation to 9806 Victoria Road South. The zoning amendment will bring an existing concrete plant and business located 
uh, um, at 9606 Victoria Road South into compliance with the district's zoning bylaw and allow further expansion. Sorry, Alex, are you, are you got the speaking notes for the zoning bylaw amendment? No, this is the right one. Okay. I just, I just repeat myself a little bit. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. The applicant is requesting a variance to section 12.2.6 E of the zoning bylaw to increase the maximum allowable height for principal and accessory uses. The variant, this variance would allow for the construction of two new concrete silos to support the proposed expansion of the current operation. The new silos are proposed at 19.69 and 21.23 meters in total height respectively. Given that the operation is expanding, larger silos, larger silos are required in order to handle the increased amount of raw material being processed at the facility. The larger silos will reduce the frequency of trucks delivering products to the site as the carriers can haul larger loads to the plant. The larger silos uh, would help co counteract the recurring issue of cement powder shortages in the Okanagan region. The new larger silos allow for the storage of one to two days worth of concrete and help protect SRM concrete from having to shut down until concrete powder is available, which has occurred several times in the past year. The existing concrete silos located at 9606 Victoria Road South reach heights of 9.7 and 13 meters. These will be demolished as part of the facility expansion. Although the new silos will be taller than the existing, it should be noted that the siting of the new silos is at a lower elevation on the property than the existing. This will help reduce the visual impact of the taller concrete silos. The increased height for the new silos is not anticipated to have an impact on neighboring properties as the area is an established industrial park. To the west, the concrete plant is flanked by the Kettle Valley Rail Trail and, a for and forestry grazing lands beyond that. As such, no residential views will be impacted by the proposed silos. The modern concrete plant will be more effective in reducing noise and dust pollution due to improved dust collection systems and the quieter plant equipment. An up-to-date concrete plant can produce concrete significantly faster, reducing the amount of idle time of trucks loading, therefore reducing vehicle emissions, pollutions created by each load of concrete produced. Given these factors and the relatively low impact to the surrounding area, staff are supportive of the height variance to allow for the installation of lar larger concrete silos. Thank you. Thank you. Managed to stumble your way through that one. <laughs> oh, okay, uh, Council, I, I won't pick on you anymore, Alex. Council, do you have any questions of Alex? Yeah. <laughs> okay, would someone like to bring forward the motion? Councillor Van Elfen? Thank you, Madam Mayor. That council authorizes issuance of development variance permit DVP 22-006 for a property located at 9806 Victoria Road South, legally described as Lot B, District Lot 439, Associates Division Yale District Plan 28778 and that a variance to the following sections of zoning bylaw 2000-450 be granted. Maximum height for principal and accessory uses, section 12.2.6E, to vary the maximum height from the lesser of 14 meters or two stories to the 21.23 meters proposed. Thank you. Seconder, Councillor Trainer. Any further discussion? Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. No, I just read the letter of rationale and one or two less concrete powder trucks up and down Victoria Road delivering product a week would be significant. <laughs> you know, they're big trucks and if this uh, silos could uh, store more materials and keep that plant functioning six or seven days a week, that would be great. Anyways, thank you, Madam Mayor. You're welcome. I like the fact that they're, you know, further off the road as well and, and up against the embankment. So that's a good thing. Any other comments? I'll call the question. All in favor? Any opposed? Okay, and that carries unanimously. 
Thank you, Alex. This one is for Brad. Development permit 10518 Jubilee Road West, uh, DP 22-008. Thank you, Alex. Okay, just while those slides are loading up. But yeah, uh, Joanne Peachy was scheduled to be here tonight. Unfortunately, she hasn't been able to attend. So me and Alex are covering her applications tonight. So please bear with us as we move forward. Uh, including with this one as well. It's one of Joanne's files. So um, so the district's in receipt of a multifamily development permit application, along with the associated variances to allow for a four unit town housing development at the corner of uh, Jubilee Road West and Dixon Avenue in close proximity to the Summerland, Summerland's downtown. Uh, right now, the subject property is currently designated as medium density residential. And if council remembers, um, this property was the subject of a recent rezoning uh, application uh, to rezone this property from residential medium lot, uh, which was his previous rezoning or previous zoning to uh, residential medium density, which you, you see now in the brown. Um, it has been designated for a long time, though, as medium density residential. Um, council did uh, approve that uh, that rezoning in October of uh, last year. So what is being proposed uh, is a four unit townhousing uh, development um, and uh, to allow for that development to occur. Uh, all of our multifamily developments within the district of Summerland requires the issuance of a multifamily form and character development permit. So that's the, the subject of this uh, application. As, but, and also to allow for this specific development to go forward, there's a number of variances required, um, mainly for the rear yard setback. Um, there's three variances associated with parking, uh, as well as a fence height uh, variance. And the majority of these uh, variances can be explained uh, due to the kind of current situation of the existing lot being surrounded by three roads, which I'll get into. Uh, already mentioned the proposal, um, two townhouse buildings, you can see from this illustrative uh, drawing from Dixon Avenue that are gonna be accessed off of Dixon Avenue with individual accesses to uh, single car garages. So the site plan, uh, it's pretty small on the screen, but it is in your agenda package. Um, already mentioned uh, vehicle access from Dixon Avenue um, there is proposed pedestrian uh, sidewalk connections as well to each unit um, from Dixon Avenue, as well as a another side entrance access point from Jubilee Road to create some definition there from, from form and character facing Jubilee. And then uh, for each unit, it's proposed to have the uh, private backyard spaces along Spencer Avenue. Um, I already mentioned that this property is bordered by three roads, three district roads, Spencer Avenue, Ju Jubilee Road, um, and also Dixon Avenue. And, and so the interpretation of uh, the district zoning bylaw uh, indicates that the front yard of the subject property, because it's the narrowest of the three roads, is Jubilee Road West. Um, so that would be the front yard of in interpreting the zoning bylaw. Therefore, the opposite yard that's adjacent to that the adjacent property owner to the north is the rear yard and that's the hence the reason for the rear yard variance um, but the way the building is situated it it'll feel like dixon avenue is the front yard and so those associated uh interpretation of our zoning bylaw versus the actual placement of the building is where a lot of these variances are coming from already mentioned one car garages uh, are included for parking. Uh, that's uh, uh, one stall for each unit within the garage, as well as another stall in front of that garage, meeting our parking requirements for two parking stalls per unit uh, required under our zoning bylaw. Uh, there's also proposed to have the tandem parking in the driveway. So having that additional space right in front of the space in the garage, and then also a bicycle parking space class A inside each of the units um, within the garage. 
Um, in terms of landscaping, uh, there there's landscaping throughout the the amenity areas of the plan, um, primarily for defining the entrances to each unit, um, as well as some attenuation facing Jubilee Road West, um, as that's kind of more of a, a larger amenity area. Um, and then as well, some private lawns uh, and with that are going to be fenced uh, for private amenity space for each unit uh, on the Spencer Ave side of the development. So in terms of form and character, uh, the, the proposal and the plans provided does provide a, uh, a lot of uh, definition um, and we feel is in conformance with the OCP guidelines. Um, there's a variation of massing. Um, it, the design avoids the use of straight walls through this use of variation and also material breakups through each of the unit spaces, as you can see from this photo in the, uh, in the presentation. As well, there's the use of recessed decks uh, above the garages to again, create some more definition and the use of dormers coming off the roof uh, and to further create definition of the building from the streetscape view. Um, the entrances of each unit are, are clearly defined uh, invisible from the, the walkways and also the landscaping as already mentioned, and they're easily accessible from the street corridor on Dixon. Uh, for the Jubilee Road West um, face, uh, very similarly, we've, uh, the design shows a, uh, a recess entrance uh, fa this facing this direction creates some definition of the building um, facing Jubilee Road West. Uh, there's a proposed porch as well as a pedestrian connection, uh, creating some building articulation and not just a flat plane uh, on, on that collector road. Another key uh, point to make here, though, is that there is no vehicle access from Jubilee Road West, which is a positive from our works department um, because they, were, they wanted to limit the number of access points on collector roads. Um, so the use of Dixon F for access is a positive as well. Uh, and then going back to now to the Spencer Ave rendering, uh, I mean, I mentioned the private backyards. You can see the fence. I'll get back to this with regards to the variance that's being proposed to create definition for each uh, uh, or define bark backyard spaces for each unit. Um, there's also still the use of dormers on the upper level there um, to create some definition in the building as well. Um, in your package, there is just um, copies of the of the floor plans. I'm not going to get into describing this. They're basically your kind of standard three bedroom unit uh, townhousing building. Um, uh, for the rear yard setback, now getting into the variances specifically, what's requested is a variance from 7.5 meters for the rear yard to three meters. Um, just for um, councils. Uh, benefit a I mean the next slide here um, when we're looking at the three roads um, that, that are, are being uh, uh, creating some of these variance concerns like if Dixon Ave was considered to be the front yard the the the, the rear yard that's currently interpreted to be the, the rear yard in our zoning bylaw would have a setback of four meters instead of 7.5 so really, I would advise council that you're, the variance that you're considering here is, uh, is, is from, the, from a form perspective, a variance from four to three, because um, uh, our multifamily uh, development does require a, a four meter setback uh, for interior side yards. Um, for parking standards, I mentioned there's, a, a, there's three variances related to parking. One is um, for ta to allow for tandem parking. Right now, our zoning bylaw restricts tandem parking, uh, hoping to avoid uh, um, uh, this type of uh, a forum uh, with, with two parking stalls back to back. But in, for rural housing, we see that as potential as, as an opportunity um, and actually something we may want to change in the future with regards to our zoning bylaw. Um, to encourage more of this type of form um, is through allowing the, that tandem parking. Um, there is um, also another variance required for parking in an exterior side yard, keeping in mind, again, Jubilee Road West is considered the front yard in our zoning bylaw. So uh, again, this is considered the exterior side yard. And so the next two variances deal with the fact that 
the parking is, is proposed to be located in the exterior side yard as opposed to the front uh, uh, for the purpose of our zoning bylaw. Um, however, in, in kind of uh, justification of these parking variances, we, we feel that this type of form and character of a building is, is is in similar scale uh, for parking of other infill projects we have throughout the district. Um, most recently, we had the Elliott Street uh, development permit. Um, there, I, I think there is going to be more demand for this type of product in Summerlin moving into the future. It's close to downtown. There's walking distance to amenities and services. So um, we think that uh, there there is uh, justification for moving forward with these variances. Uh, and then just lastly here for the fence site, um, uh, there's also another further variance to allow for a, a larger fen uh, fence site from 1.2 meters uh, in the exterior side yard uh, to 1.83 meters. Again, keeping in mind that this isn't considered the rear yard. If it was considered the rear yard, you're allowed to go up to uh, about this height. Um, I think it's a little larger than this actually. Um, for a rear yard fence, but because this is considered the side yard, um, it, we don't, our bylaw restricts it to 1.2. So the 1.83 meter uh, height um, is just kind of your standard rear yard fence height. It allows for more private backyard spaces and as well meets our design guidelines in the OCP. So in summary, we feel at the staff level that this project uh, does meet the design guidelines of our OCP. Um, it, it encourages uh, housing choices in close proximity to our downtown core. Um, and we feel that these are, these are a product that can be considered a little more affordable with three bedroom units, perhaps more catering to young families coming into our community and a type of uh, development we want to encourage uh, in close proximity to the downtown core. And happy to take any questions. Thank you. Questions, Council? Councillor Holmes. Yeah, I was just wondering if there's any reason that this development couldn't have been designed so that um, there's units fronting both Dixon and Spencer. Um, so you don't really have a, a backyard facing onto a street, um, either, you know, spreading either with, you know, two units on each side or even increasing the density um, either way. Is there any reason that wouldn't be would be possible? Thanks. Uh, if council is minor, we actually have the architect on the line. It might be that question might be better suited to the architect to answer than myself at the staff level. If you're willing to can allow him to speak. Is that Mr. Giroux? Yeah, I'm just waiting for an invitation. Yeah. All right, um, please, please go ahead if you're able to answer that question of Councillor Holmes. For sure. So we did, when we started the initial design, we did look at options to um, orient it so that the front street, the front uh, setback was off of Jubilee and the rear setback was facing the neighboring property. But what ended up happening was the building footprint that it allowed because of taking six meters off of off the one side and seven off the other. Um, what was left was not enough to get uh, four units. It was maybe enough to get two units. So the only way we could get the building footprint we needed was to get the, the layout of the property that we have now. Um, so we did look at that thoroughly. And this the concept with this design would be consistent with what we're doing with other projects within the Okanagan in other municipalities. So, um, as was mentioned, there may be some of these features now that are not within your bylaw that might be worth considering as, as Summerland is becoming a more desirable place for development. Um, these would be maybe more common features that we would uh, look to put in other projects moving ahead. Okay, other questions? Councillor Barkwell. In some ways, I think we should just be speaking about the, the, the proposal in front of us, but I am curious now that Councillor Holmes has brought it up, whether a, a project like we see a lot of down in Penticton 
say near Brunswick Street, where there's roads where the um, the houses are, there's a road on both sides, and so you could have two units back to back, and they're both on uh, facing the street. And in that particular case, you'd be off the less busy Dixon and Spencer instead of trying to pull in and out of uh, Jubilee. Is that was that considered? Are you familiar with that design? There's quite a few of them there in Penticton. Yeah, so we've done most of those in Penticton, um, on in that area. So I I understand what you're saying. So this the concept of not having the parking coming off of Jubilee was was paramount in our decision for um, having the parking coming off of uh, Dixon. Um, it's not as it's not a busy street, so we didn't see any value in splitting half of the parking coming off of each each street. Rather, we thought it would be better to have it more consistent for the look of the building and for emergency services to have one frontage where most of the doors were facing one way, and then having the private yards on the back side of the building be more consistent as well, rather than having vehicles coming and going on both sides. So. Um, Yeah, we, we did look at a number of different opportunities with this, but um, we're limited. We were limited by the options with the bylaw, the current bylaw. So we just decided to come with the variances that we're requesting and see if um, we could make this work. Councillor Barkwell. So uh, I guess when the picturing those um, those buildings, there isn't really any backyard because they're back to back. Do our bylaws not uh, permit that type of construction then? Uh, I, I suppose you could get more building on the smaller footprint with that uh, with that concept. Uh, I'm just going to uh, go to Brad yeah. uh, to respond to this. No, I, to answer the question uh, through the chair to Councillor Barkwell, uh, it, our bylaws could allow for that type of development. Our, mandating backyard spaces for multifamily development there is a requirement for amenity areas so you, the architect would have to consider what offset of amenity areas uh, are they providing elsewhere on the property if you're going to be using that for um uh for a building footprint and rather than yard space because that that backyard uh, uh private yard spaces are going contributing to their our amenity calculation of of, of for each unit. Um, well, I do want to mention one thing, other thing for council to be aware of. Um, I didn't breeze, uh, go over this in my presentation, but the, the developer and, and uh, architect are, are also proposing as part of this um, development, uh, um, two meters of road dedication on Spencer Avenue and also 0.6 meters of road dedication on, on Spencer and also 2.8 meters on um, Jubilee Road West, which has been flagged as something that the Public Works Department would like to see happen, and also the, the off-street uh, improvements from all three roads uh, around the property, uh, which uh, will also be triggered from this development. So we are, because of those things, we are substantially reducing the footprint of uh, that this development has to work with um, in terms of yard areas. and. And building footprint, and that would probably impact his site coverage as well. So, um, in fairness to the applicant, they 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 probably don't have as much land area as they started off with in uh, initial discussions uh, with staff. Councillor Trainer, I um I like this this uh, design that I'm seeing here, and I think this is something that we need more of, especially for our families. Um, I'm just thinking about the backyards. Um, will they have gates that open onto Spencer so that um, if there's kids in the backyard or um, you know people want to go out their backyard and onto Spencer and go for a walk, will they be able to do that? I'm just thinking that that kind of opens up the access to Spencer and, and kind of creates a two-way, two entrances. I guess my question is for the developer. Okay, yeah, so that right now that's not in the plans, but that's that's a very good suggestion. It's probably something that would be put in. Um, so I would say that Mr. Bowman would probably consider that seriously. Yeah, I think that that might add a sense of community um, 
a neighborhoodness, I guess, on both sides, um, both the front and the back, if you had a gate on the back yard. Thank you. Councillor Holmes and then Councillor Van Elfen. Yeah, my, uh, you know, I, I appreciate, um, I appreciate the design in the sense of, you know, the, the, the work on the Jubilee side, how the entrance there creates definition and how the Dixon side and, and Jubilee, all, all that, um, the work f fits in with form and character. It all looks great. Um, but for me, where it all falls apart is on the Spencer side. If you live on Spencer, you're going to be walking past every day this high fence and, and you know, on a residential street. And that's, uh, who wants that on their street? You know, um, I, to, so to me, I think there's a real lost opportunity here. There's, there's an opportunity to, um, to do something on both sides that'll enhance both streets, Dixon and, and Spencer. And, and I think we're enhancing Dixon at the expense of Spencer. And, um, that's, uh, you know, I, I don't, I, I don't think we need to do that. I, I think it can be designed in such a way. And, and even if it means giving more variances, um, because I'd rather give a variance for something else. So to allow uh, something fronting Spencer than to give a variance for a, a high fence on, on, on um, Spencer to, to give more privacy to people um, because that's a street. So that's just my comments, thanks. Councillor Van Elfen. I was going to put the motion on the floor, but now I'm thinking. Okay. I'll put it on the floor. <clears throat> that development permit of application DP 22-008 for the construction of one townhouse building to be constructed at uh, 10518 Jubilee Road West and legally described as lot one district lot 3640 the Soyuz Division Yale District Plan 4288 be approved subject to one receipt of a performance security for landscaping in the amount of 20,000 with the following variance to zoning bylaw number 2000-450 to increase the maximum height for a fence situated in the exterior side yard of the residential zone lot as prescribed at section 5.5.6B from 1.2 meters to 1.83 meters and to vary the regulations as prescribed as section 6.55 to allow vehicle parking spaces to be configured in tandem for townhouse housing and to vary the regulations as prescribed at section 6.6.3 to allow off street vehicle parking spaces to be located no closer than 1.2 meters of the exterior side property line abutting Dixon Avenue to reduce the minimum rear yard setback as prescribed as section 10.86A2 from 7.5 meters to three meters measured to the outmost projection and to vary the regulations as prescribed at section 10.8.7a to allow parking in the required exterior side yard abutting Dixon Avenue. Seconder, Councillor Barkwell. And further discussion, Councillor Barkwell. Yes, thank you, uh, Mayor, uh, Madam Mayor. I was just wondering, um, Dixon Avenue is the one you've taken the least amount of land off of, and uh, you've taken a couple of meters off of Spencer. Isn't Dixon the one that is narrower to begin with and might have increased traffic if once the Legion Village is redeveloped? Wouldn't it have been better maybe to, but I don't know how that lines up with everything else, <laughs> to sort of do what you could to widen that one. Uh, through your worship to Councillor Barkle, that you know the the issue of land uh, a road dedication required um, for for development is something that 
you, you can't look at just the property itself. You got to look at the property across the road as well as the future alignment of the road going down Dixon Ave as well as on Spencer Ave for for determining these width amounts um, and also knowing what our standards are for local roads um, uh, and what is our future plan for future cross sections in this area. Um, just looking at our, my GIS, although, although Dixon is not as Im improved in this in its current state right now. Um, it, it, it has a much larger right away in front of the Legion vi village and then it jogs uh, inwards from the existing property uh, directly uh, across from from this property. And I think like there's almost probably eight or nine meters of that jog um, going in um, from uh, from the Legion village property. So we're looking at aligning that road it probably wasn't as neat as much width on the other side, but rather we'd be taking additional land from the property owner uh, uh, to the east across from Dixon Ave uh, when that property moves forward with development. And uh, as part of that, yeah, that larger Dixon Ave uh, project, I think um, in combination with this project, we probably would do want to be making some road upgrades to Dixon Avenue uh, in the near term if the, both these projects proceed. So um, we'd be looking at probably making an interim solution until that uh, adjacent pro or property across the street at 105.16 goes forward with development. I see what you mean that uh, one property is kind of the problem there. Um, Councillor Holmes gave me pause for a moment when he was talking about that big fence and everything, but also I remembered this building is not, uh, not unlike the very first property I owned with a little tiny backyard and a big fence and but there's also a, like a cedar hedge and a tree and stuff and and a street that people walked along out and um, it was it just seemed all part of a normal neighborhood it didn't seem like uh, anything that was too uh, um, ugly and obtrusive and so I after reconsidering my reconsideration of his <laughs> I think I can support the, the project with the fence. Okay, Councillor Van Elfen. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'm excited. I like I like what I see. I like the uh, architect's rendition of this property. Um, long overdue. It's great to see you know this infill happening so close to our downtown core. Fingers crossed that those backyards will have children in them, and uh, you know it'll just bring more young people to our community. And if not retirees, but either or, it would be exciting to see this uh, development go forward. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Exactly what we'd like to see with this infill. Councillor Carlson, did you have a comment? Yeah, just briefly, um, and then maybe I maybe I missed it, but as the rest of Dixon and Spencer potentially get redeveloped over over time, um, it's can will be consistent that Dixon will be. The front and Spencer, like, is there going to be consistency? Because right now, I mean, I walk often and there's people, you know, but you wouldn't know what's the front and what's the back on many of these properties. And I just wonder if, um, if it's going to, if it has to be in a plan or if it matters. To uh, your worship, to Councilor Carlson, that's a great question. I, I for, um, I'm looking at. The properties to the north I, I do see most of their accesses are coming off of dixon um uh, we don't really have a plan like there, it's kind of we have a few of these properties that are double fronting on two uh local roads throughout the district we have someone close to south victoria as well um it's it's kind of what the applicant's looking to do as well as um what fits bet best for the neighborhood and to determine what type of project um, could go in this area in terms of rear yard versus front yard and and, ac and access points. Um, uh, I think uh, for future development, we would look at what has been done in other uh, properties in proximity, uh, such as this one, and probably encourage the developer to go a different way, but there wouldn't be anything really holding them to that um, other than our driveway access bylaw, which limits the amount of access points to the property.
Okay, if there's no further discussion, I'll call the question all in favor. Opposed? Councillor Holmes is opposed. Nine point four zoning bylaw amendment for water use regulations bylaw number twenty twenty two dash zero two four. Brad, I guess this is yours as well. Yeah, thank you, Worship. Um, so, if council members, um, uh, that we were reporting back to a previous direction from council to review uh, our district wide uh, zoning bylaw um, with regards to our water use regulations for uh, marina stocks and warfare facilities across all our zones. So some background as to where this came from. Um, in October of 2021, so this past fall, we received a, a council direction uh, from council to initiate a review of our water use regulations. Um, specifically at that time, it was with regards to the WZ3, our intensive water use zones. Um, but it was subsequently added to all of our zones uh, and, and further council discussions um, followed from that. Um, we, we tried to, uh, in early part of 2021, we tried to lump uh, this review as part of a, a, an administrative review of our zoning bylaw that was presented to council in, in late April. Um, and council direction at that time point in time, at first reading of that uh, administrative update amendment bylaw, was that the uh, water use regulations should be reviewed at its on its own, um, be brought back before council at a later meeting, um, and specifically consider uh, setbacks uh, with regards to our water use zones, uh, and report back with proposed amendment changes. And that's why we're here uh, before you tonight, uh, as we've since redrafted our water use regulations. Um, and we've reviewed them with our advisory planning commission and received comment back from them and are ready now for council's consideration. So uh, as council has seen a few times before now with regards to our water use zones, we have some guidelines uh, within our official community plan. There is support for uh, enhancing our water use activities uh, when the natural function of the foreshore is maintained and the environment is enhanced um, in our OCP. There's also specific policy, policies for the lower town area and the lower town strategic plan of our OCP, which encourages uh, public boat docking and mooring. Um, with regards to our water use zones currently, uh, what we have in place, uh, most of our shoreline along Okanagan Lake is zone WZ1, uh, which allows for accessory docks only. Uh, and beyond that 100 meter mark of the lake, uh, the zoning flips from WZ1 to WZ2, which restricts any uh, permanent structures within that zone. So WZ2 is prim primarily a protection zone. It also limits uh, anchorage um, and only allows recreational activities on the water past that 100 meter mark uh, as to protect uh, the boundary around uh, Summerlin. Um, through the, the use of zoning uh, past the 100 meter mark. Uh, for WZ3, uh, our intensive water use zone, we primarily only have little pocket areas of where this zone is being applied. Um, it's primarily in our lower town area um, next to the waterfront resort and the existing yacht club, um, and as well as our, our park areas such as Rotary Beach, uh, Peach Orchard Park, Horse Beach, I believe is also uh, WZ3 and uh, I think the yeah uh, there's another sailing club piece that's also WZ3. Um, in the WZ1 uh, zone, uh, uh, docks and bow lifts are considered an accessory use and it's accessory to the single family dwelling use. So you need to have a single family dwelling use. Sorry. Um, uh, to allow for a dock uh, in order for it to be allowed um, and as well uh, boat lifts are allowed if part of a dock uh, currently. There are specific use regulations for, for those uh, accessory use docks which are currently in our bylaw but again it's only specific to uh, uh, the WZ1 zone currently. Just uh, some of the regulations within this, our zoning bylaw, uh, again mentioned it's only applied to accessory use of dock 
docks and boat lifts and the WZ1. Generally, these our current regulations already follow the provincial general use permissions that are provided by the, uh, the ministry uh, to waterfront uh, landowners. So we're we're being consistent with the province uh, with our current regulations. In the following regulations, uh, one dock up to 40 meters in length, which is consistent with the province. Uh, no foreshore obstruction uh, other than, and if there is a dock, that there be steps provided to go over the dock um, to maintain that public access. Uh, a maximum width of uh, three or five meters uh, is currently in our bylaw. Um, and the, the extension of L or T extension limits, which is also consistent. Uh, and then also uh, setbacks from other uh, a docks or also setbacks from the side property line, which is also five meters for these single use docks. Um, for uh, our proposal, um, we are proposing generally that we have specific use regulations that are applied to all marinas, docks, and wharfish facilities. So not just the WZ1 zoned areas, but also WZ3. Uh, and then we have unique uh, regulations proposed for just the WZ1 and then also just the WZ3 if we're talking about, about a more intensive uh, water use uh, um, uh, application within that area. So you'll see a little bit of differences between those two zones, which I'll get into here. Uh, for the WZ1 zones, uh, most of it has been consistent from what was there before. There's only primarily housekeeping edits to the wording of the regulation um, and, and to have it consistent to all, apply to all structures uh, versus just those within the, as an accessory use. Um, we've also removed one uh, regulation that referenced the BC building code because we didn't think it was appropriate that a zoning bylaw referenced the building code as any references to the building code has to be within a building bylaw. So that's just a administrative change there. So getting into the specific use uh, regulations for a new section that we're calling marinas, docks, and other wharfage facilities. These are uh, general use, or specific use regulations across the WZ1 and WZ3 zones. We're recommending a regulation of one structure per lot, except for on, in our park areas, um, could have more than one structure. Um, again, the steps requirement, which is consistent with the province, a maximum width of three meters uh, of the dock for private moorage or five meters five meters for others uh, and then also uh, a maximum width for 1.5 meters uh, for an access ramp for public access uh, lrt extensions which there's a little diagram there kind of explaining what those look like can only have be uh, to a maximum nine meters or one half of the upland frontage um, consistent orientation with our neighbors to be, to be cognizant of the orientation of their, their neighbors' docks. Uh, a 10 meter uh, setback from other structures, which is currently in our bylaw. Um, so it has to be at least 10 meters from your other, the, your neighbor's dock. Uh, and then no roof or, or overhang uh, um, structures uh, on boat, over boat lifts or docks. Um, the draft, as already mentioned, includes specific regulations for the WZ1 zone as well as the WZ3 zone. And there's a couple of examples here to illustrate these differences. Um, the size and setback regulations are different for each, for each zone. And the WZ3, keep in mind, allows for more intensive uh, uh, dock applications. Uh, and for that reason, there is a 160 meter extension for the WZ3 uh, regulation, uh, and then as well a, a 10 meter setback from the linear extension of the property line. So it's a little bit different interpretation of that extension of the property line. Uh, we feel this is um, probably a cleaner approach moving forward for WZ3 areas is extending the, the upland parcels property lines out into the lake. For the WZ1 area, you can actually see it's a little bit different of an angle uh, of those lines extending out. We're, we're being consistent here with the province and their general use provisions, and they measure that angle based on the natural uh, uh, shoreline ang angle of the upland property. So um, not just the property lines, but more so the shoreline uh, angle um, should be the uh, angle of the extending of those lines. 
Could we could we pause just sure, for a couple yeah. of questions? Councillor Carlson and then Councillor Barkwell and then Councillor Trainer. Um, thank you. Uh, my question is on WZ1. If the maximum length of a dock is 40 meters, then why is the max why is the actual length of the zone 100 meters? Um, what is that 60 meter buffer for? Uh, through your worship to Councillor Carlson, I think primarily was to restrict uh, anchorage, um, any permanent anchorage past the 100 meter mark. We didn't want the district at the time, like when we built these regulations, I think we wanted to discourage random anchorage uh, 100 meters out. And that was part of the rationale for the WZ2 zone being included. Yeah, uh, so last time we talked about this, um, you, I, we saw that the provincial regulations were that the docks were to be perpendicular to the shoreline. And you've gone with that for the WZ zone, WZ1, sorry, but why would you change it for the WZ3 zone? It doesn't, why, why aren't, don't you stay consistent? Well, we definitely could uh, if council prefers that approach. I think it, it, it made it, sometimes we, I felt, I think that we felt that um, the, it was hard to interpret where, what the natural, the angle of that natural boundary is. And we, we for the WZ1 zones, because we are consistent with the general provision, we wanted to be consistent with the province. So that made sense, but we do have more flexibility with the WZ3 zone to set our own requirements. And um, I think that that the extension of the upland property owner from an interpretation perspective is much more straightforward. Um, you can just follow that line going straight out into the water. And in reality, it, you can see the chain, the difference between the two here. It's not a huge difference. Um, and again, keeping in mind where WZ3 zone zones are, there it's pretty much in the lower town area, it is fairly straight. Um, going on Long Lakeshore Drive there with those upland property owners. So, you know, if we are trying to be consistent uh, with the WZ1 zones, and if, if council wants to include that as a friendly amendment tonight, um, I don't think it really will make a huge difference from uh, the WZ3 area as well. Do, do you have a follow up? Okay, it's Councillor. It, it, yeah, Councillor Trainer, and then Councillor Holmes, and then I'll come back. Um, in the report um, under the section, the Advisory Planning Commission, their comments, they said that, made a comment that the 160 meter extension into the lake in the WZ3 zone was aggressive and arbitrary. Do you know why they said that and what they meant by that? Uh, uh, through your worship to Councillor Trainer, I, I wasn't unfortunately I wasn't at that APC meeting. Joanne was there on on staff's behalf. Um, I uh, I'm not too sure why they asked that, but I I think they they, they did question like where that 160 meter uh, extension came from. Um, and in response, uh, I think uh, I did ask Joanne as well that question uh, in light of APC's comments. Um, and uh, she did a review of kind of what the, the, our existing situation is so with the Yacht Club. Um, we didn't want to create a non-conforming situation either with, with that um, facility and, and that uh, uh, facility is right around that 157 meter mark from the shoreline. Um, we, we think that it is a more intensive water use zone. Uh, we, there's only select areas which uh, we have it zoned that zone, and um, in, you know, in order to allow a more substantial dock, we we do we do have to extend it probably out past that 40 meter mark, um, and it's for that reason, for those two reasons, I guess that we went with the 160 meter mark. So the 160 is based on what we already have down in Lower Town. That's where that number came from from the yacht club. That's correct. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Councillor Holmes. So the um, in the WZ1, it's a perpendicular extension from the shoreline, which is which is consistent with provincial regulations. That's correct. So, but um, what are the provincial regulations for for the WZ3 example for for marinas and whatnot? Is it is that perpendicular or 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 extension of the property line? 
uh, through your worship to Councillor Holmes, I think uh, more intensive water use applications go through a different type of process that they, they, they don't have technical guidelines that are publicly available. They have a review process that's, I think, quite extensive. And uh, I think there's also more flexibility uh, that the province has to allow for different types of orientations of the dock structure or buildings even on the water that they probably would allow um, for more intensive water use applications. So um, I'm, I, I, I don't know if there'd, it'd be a consistent interpretation or not, um, but the general provision wouldn't apply uh, to that more intensive water use application. Okay, back to you, Councillor Barkwell. Yeah, thank you. I, I was just looking, I had printed out some material from the provincial government, but I guess I didn't bring it. Um, I, I guess if you asked, had asked me, uh, to, starting fresh, that extensions from the property lines would be the neatest and, and, and tidiest way to do it because it's quite visual, but that's not the way it's gone. Uh, the province, in their wisdom, who deals with a lot more than lakeshores than we do, has put in this this uh, perpendicular to the shoreline rule, and that's what we have in uh, here with our WZ1. I would think that the worst combination is, or the worst choice between the two, is to have a mixture, and and to be inconsistent from one zone to the next. So I think I would propose that um, the WZ3 be uh, consistent with the WZ1 and, and perpendicular to the shoreline. Um, when the time comes, I'm not sure if I should uh, make that proposal as an amendment after first reading or to try and read that into the proposed uh, bylaw in the, uh, the wording here in the... Uh, Agenda. But anyway, I put it out there for further discussion. Okay. Um, Brad, would you like to finish the rest of your presentation now and then we can open for more questions? Well, I can. I, we did have already talked to uh, some of uh, these items. I'll just try to breeze through them already. So this was just provided as an example of the 10 meter setback from the linear extension of side property lines um, from Joanne showing roughly what that 10 meter looks like um, for this specific park area. Um, I want to mention as well that Joanne did complete a, a jurisdictional comparison of our proposed bylaw as well as the, the current bylaws uh, of, uh, for those jurisdictions that, that do zone the, the water, um, Penticton, RDOS, Peachland, and West Kelowna. Uh, as well as Asuyas. Um, there's no setbacks uh, in their zones for Penticton, RDOS, Peachland, or West Kelowna. They have other re restrictions, though, uh, in RDOS, like the number of births per lot um, for docks is, I think, a uh, restriction in both RDOS and Asuyas. Um, there is, however, I'm sorry, uh, setbacks uh, required um, in the Kelowna's and Asuyas' bylaw, which, again, is fairly consistent um, to the province, and although a little bit different than what we've gone with, with the perpendicular extension, they've gone just with the linear extension of those property lines, which is uh, what we were recommending for the WZ3 zone areas. Um, APC comments, it was already kind of mentioned, some of the comments um, from APC, um, some questions of how these proposed amendments will impact ongoing applications. Uh, which were answered by staff. Um, again, the question about the Yacht Club being compliant with these proposed regulations, um, which we uh, comment back on. ABC was, uh, although uh, despite these questions, supportive of the pro proposed regulations uh, for council moving forward for the first and second reading. Uh, and so in summary, um, what we're doing here today was to try to apply consistent regulations for all of our dock and boat lift regulations to all water use zones. Um, again, interpretation between WZ1 and WZ3 maybe being a little bit different, 
Um, we're keeping WZ1 DOC permissions pretty much the same as what's currently in our bylaw, as well as fairly consistent with the province. And we're adding new regula regulations for the WZ3, which includes um, that, that 10 meter setback, um, the uh, maximum extension into the lake of 160 meters, um, and then also, uh, one thing I haven't mentioned yet was citing the wharfage uh, that's being placed on the intensive water use uh, areas, the opposite side of a potential park or swim area. So to try to avoid boat traffic going into those beach areas that are being publicly accessible. And so that's another uh, provision we've included uh, within the WZ3. But uh, we're looking for first and second reading. It could be first and second reading as amended by council if they so choose, but hoping to move forward uh, to public hearing on July 11th. Thank you. Okay, um, I, I have one question. It comes out of the APC comments. And that was a question about how these amendments will impact the land request crescent development or the oasis development can you bring us up to date on on potential impacts or if there aren't any impacts at all yeah so we, we have both those projects in application stream right now um it is uh, we've I've, I've discussed with the agents with both those projects um about uh, the timing uh of these regulations in relation to their projects um it, it's difficult for us to bring forward their, their applications while the, these amendments are being midstream in council's review and consideration because all of the, uh, the associated regulations uh, and their um, section numbers are being changed. And from a practical uh, and logistical perspective, we need to reference the right uh, sections if there's any variances required as an example. So. Um, my uh, go forward plan with, with both of them, and they are both aware of this, is if council does move forward to a public hearing and subsequently to adoption with these regulations, then we'll be uh, proceeding fairly quickly with those applications to council for consideration following those amendments. And so those applications may or may not include variances? That's correct. Okay, thank you. Councillor Trainer. Brad, could you confirm what the zoning is around Trout Creek right now? Is it all WZ1? That's correct. It is. Okay. Thank you. Sorry, just to clarify, I think Powell Beach and maybe Sunoka, just to confirm, uh, might be WZ3 as well. I'll get in front of those park areas. Yeah, Powell's WZ3, I believe. Thank right. you. Yeah. And Sonoka, yeah. Okay, any other questions? Would someone like to bring forward uh, first and second reading? I think it's first and second. Yes, Councillor Barkle. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I'll move that uh, zoning amendment bylaw water use regulation number 2022-024 be read a first and second time with the amendment that marinas and docks in 14.3.5 sub B be perpendicular uh, extensions from the general trend of the shoreline. And, and that. And that a public hearing be held on July 1st 2022 to receive public feedback on the zoning amendment bylaw water use regulations number 2022-024. July 11th. July 11th? Oh, what did I say? First, oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, seconder, Councillor Holmes, and further discussion. Councillor Barkwell. Um, somebody asked about uh, Trout Creek and such. So, um, and because I'm getting a lot of questions about the land recrescent proposal ahead of time, if somebody wanted to build a dock, just a normal one that went 40 meters out or something, um, it wouldn't really necessarily come to council with the current regulations or anything. No. 
Through your worship to uh, Councilor Barquell. No, uh, our current regulations are, are fairly consistent with what we're proposing for the WZ1 zone areas. Um, you know, if, if as long as you're in conformance with their current regulations, we should be fine um, with proceeding with any project. I'm just trying to visualize a uh, shoreline that is not straight, but you know, kind of, and how perpendicular docks would look. I know, but one of those dots is kind of, you know, in off kilter. <laughs> Councillor Holmes. Well, th that's what makes this so difficult because the shoreline goes like this, but then property lines also go like this as well, right? So, so it's nothing. It's it, nothing's cut and dry. You know, once the property lines all make sense on the land, and uh, and then but once you hit the water, it just whoosh. so so uh, it, that's why this is difficult because I don't think there's um, a right or wrong in in terms of that. But I I agree with Councillor Barkwell that um, let's be consistent then. Um, you know, that's that's the way I look at it. So. Councillor Barkwell. Yeah, I'm not sure if I can move my arms like that, but uh, that's the way it is. But I think what we also, we start off with consistent regulations and then if somebody needs a variance and it makes sense because of that particular situation, then you make an you know, application for a variance and the neighbours get to say, you know, have their say on it and everything and um, hopefully it all works out. I can see it restricting latecomers to being able to build a dock, though. That would be my concern. Councillor Van Alphen. Question through our planner. So on the land request of the situation, uh, on today with no variances, they could have multiple docks? Uh, currently, our, our WZ1 regulations restrict one dock per upland owner, and right now, that whole development is a strata it's considered one upland owner okay thank you okay any further discussion call the question all in favor and none opposed thank you okay uh, 10.1 Zoning Bylaw Amendment 13607 Rumble Avenue, bylaw number 2019-042. Excuse me, Madam Mayor, this was a, pro a, pro a property that I did have financial implications with, but no longer have. So I'm not sure if I have to uh, excuse myself. The only one that needs to determine that is you. Well, so I if you think no, you're all good, then you're all good. I'm all good. Okay, thank you for bringing that out. Okay, so this is a bylaw amendment uh, to consider for adoption. Does anyone have any questions on that? Could I have someone bring forward the motion to adopt then? Bylaw amendment. Thank you, Councillor Holmes. Seconder, Councillor Van Alphen. Another chance if there's any discussion. All in favor? Thank you, that carries. Nothing from Community of the Whole or Closed. Any notices of motion this evening? All right. Information items 13.1. There's several items of correspondence. Anything that anyone would like to bring forward? A couple of RDOS reports and an OBWB report. Councillor Patton. Thank you, Madam Mayor. Um, uh, item I for Dan Maja being recognized by the uh, by the uh, association. 
I, I'm not sure if it was the uh, the license inspectors association, not the building inspectors association. So it was um, it was nice to see that he was uh, recognized for his efforts in uh, retrieving that gentleman. Thank you. Reviving. Yeah, Mr. <laughs> Mr. Clark. Okay. Uh, anything else, correspondence-wise? And one piece of uh, committee commission minutes, Parks and Recreation Advisory Committee meeting uh, from way back to February the 8th. That looks good. All right. So could I have someone bring forward um, to receive the minutes and correspondence for information? Councillors Holm and Van Elfen, all in favour? Thank you. And anybody waiting to speak with us? No. Oh, I sorry, I missed the councillor reports. Um, councillor Patton. Uh, nothing to report, Madam Mayor. All right. Uh, Van Elfen, Councillor Van Elfen. Uh, thank you, Madam Mayor. Not a whole lot to report. Enjoyed our day out with uh, Nona Campy. Um, I thought it was quite educational, to be honest with you. Uh, I learned a lot. And again, uh, we saw the rattlesnakes, which kind of blew my mind. And uh, just interesting, very, very interesting, tying the, you know, the whole feral horse situation into the residential school conversation, which I would have never put the two together but it really makes a lot of sense today after hearing the explanations and stuff. So I really appreciated the time uh, out there. Like, I, to be honest with you, I really wasn't looking all that forward to it. You know, I don't know, and I, I'm being sincere. I was busy. I had a lot of things on my plate, as we all do. But after coming home from that, I really enjoyed my day. You know, and I'm really glad that I made the time and uh, I thought it was very informative. Thank you. You're welcome, and I'm glad that you were there as well. Okay, uh, Councillor Trainer. Nothing tonight, thank you. Thank you, Councillor Barkwell. Um, I don't have anything, but I have a question for Councillor Van Alphen. Do you have a certain aversion to snakes? Or, uh, um, I <laughs> Councillor Carlson. Um, just that a rattlesnake is actually a bad omen, so they're avoided at all costs. At least that's what we were told by Miss Campy, so that was an interesting piece. Um, nothing else to report, thank you. We think it probably lived in the hollowed out log that Dan Maya was sitting on. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> He wasn't very happy. Um, Councillor Holmes. Yeah, Dan Maya was very interested in that rattlesnake. I thought he got a little too close for, uh, for comfort because I wasn't going to revive him. I knew that. So, uh, but anyway, uh, I, I just wanted to mention uh, a few a few events. Uh, one, the Action Fest. It was great to see it back. Uh, you could just tell on people's faces that they were so happy to have this event re return after um, after uh, a couple years, I um, and the Giants had run. So I'd like to just congratulate the organizers of of both of, uh, and uh, for for putting it on. Um, the weather tried really hard to throw a wrench into it, but it, it didn't quite succeed. Um, my my son actually came back from he's in Bamp for the summer. He came back uh, specifically to compete in the slow pitch turn. They got the team back together, and uh, he was very proud that they were a finalist in the F group. <laughs> so uh, I, I I usually run the Giants Head Run. I didn't this year, so I was a race marshal, <laughs> which gave me the an opportunity to tell people where to go, which I don't get to do very often. So um, and. Uh, and a lot of staff actually participated in the run, including uh, Brad over there, uh, and um, and I know uh, Joe Mitchell. Uh, he was one of the uh, top guys. So congratulations to him. Uh, oh yes, of course, <laughs> and of course, uh, Councillor Carlson and her whole family. And it was amazing, you know, the people uh, pushing. Uh, pushing uh, so many strollers, strollers doing that run. I don't know if I don't know if that helps 
you yeah. aid you in your in your run you know be a support or uh, or if it makes it harder i don't know but it was great to see it was just great to see that everybody back and I, you know i just heard i i think the whole weekend was a great success and um it's such a it's so great for the community that that's back and another event that has returned after a couple of years was the business after business a chamber events it was held at lunescence winery and the turnout there was excellent as well and and again you could just tell people were so happy to be able to go back and, and do something that they used to be part of their regular routines and and uh, it, it was a, a a great job by the chamber organizing that and look forward to future ones and, and finally on june 1st was um I, I guess it's the, the final. It was the final meeting of the downtown plan task force. They're, we're talking about maybe they'll have one more, but basically their job is done. Um, we re, we received the draft uh, that was presented at committee of the whole today, and um, so so I, I just like to put a, a huge thanks out to all the members of the community who uh, have contributed and put in their time over the past year and a half to to serve on that task force, and I think they really served the community well. And um, I don't know if we can uh, if we can give them some sort of thanks. Um, th I, that would be a, a nice uh, appreciated, I think. So that's my report. All right, Councillor Van Elfen. Just wanted to add, Madam Mayor, the RDOS reports are riveting. The front page of the review last week has a picture of the start of the Giants head run. It's a great picture. Okay, I will uh, call for adjournment. Councillor Van Elfen and Councillor Carlson, all in favor? Thank you.